Hello and welcome everybody to this session, uh, essentially on uh, development reporting, development journalism and issues around it. Uh, my name is Joseph Warungu. I'm going to be moderating this session. Uh, and the way we'll do it is that we'll, um, I'll ask each of the speakers to introduce themselves briefly about what they do so that you can get the context of where they're coming from. And then I've asked them to tackle the issue of what uh, parachute journalism means to them. And once we've done that, I'll have a, you know, I may have a couple of follow-up questions with them and we'll leave enough time to have a discussion uh, with you. So I am a journalist myself. I have used a parachute many times in my life. <laughs> I don't know whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I am a journalist, formerly spent 20 years reporting and working for the BBC. Uh, so there have been plenty of parachutes. I think we're all a community on the panel of parachute journalism. We'll give you the context, we'll give you what we were doing, um, etc. So without much ado, I'm going to kick off uh, with Paul, uh, Miles, who's next to me, to tell us a little bit about uh, himself um, and then to answer my question of what parachute journalism means to him and whether he's done it. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, so my name's Paul Miles, and I'm from an organization called On Our Radar. Have, have, has anyone in the room, has everyone in the room heard of the term parachute journalism before? Put your hand up if you have. Okay, so I guess for those who haven't, the term, as I understand it, is about um, journalists, kind of news crews, documentary makers, who, you know, fly into a place and grab some pictures quickly, grab some footage, go out um, when they've got the quotes they need and don't necessarily feed back to the communities. And the focus of this panel today actually was on um, parachute journalism in the context of development reporting. But I think it's important to note because at, on our radar, we work with communities in the UK and um, in, in so-called developing countries that you can parachute in the UK as well. So I think we've seen a lot of it at the moment in the UK with Brexit happening and things of London-based journalists trying to go to these high streets or towns um, and um, hear from, um, you, you know, hear from people about why um, they want to leave the, um, the EU. So um, just I want to give you a little bit of background about On Our Radar's work and how we try to avoid um, parachute journalism. So um, we were set up in 2012 and our mission is to try and work with um, communities that are typically excluded from, from the media who are less likely to participate in media and storytelling. And we try to train them and to work with them um, using the tools that they feel most comfortable with to share their own story in their own words and be able to report um, on, um, on their own um, issues as they understand them. We see these communities as experts in their own experience. And um, I'll give you a few examples maybe um, that help to highlight, maybe actually one from um, abroad and, and one from the UK of um, how we've tried to avoid sort of parachuting in and um, collaborate more directly and more intentionally with a community. So. Um, the first example um, I'd like to give is in Sierra Leone, where we happen to have done a lot of work. And it was actually the first project we did as an organization in 2012. And what, what we did is um, we, we got some funding to go and cover the elections in Sierra Leone in 2012. And instead of one journalist um, who can be in one place parachuting in, to use the term, and um, um, covering the elections, we used that trip to, to train a network of community journalists in just a couple of days in the basic skills, the basic 101 of reporting. And what's really important for us when trying to work with marginalized groups is to try and find um, the tools that they would be most comfortable using so that they don't feel excluded from the storytelling process. So in Sierra Leone, where only about 13% of people are regularly using smartphones, we realized that if we wanted to really hear from some of the most remote and marginalized communities, that we, um, we needed to build a platform, use a platform that allowed people to submit um, their, their stories via SMS. And also um, in Sierra Leone, where some people in rural areas 
have less literacy skills, um, how they could um, submit reports using audio, using voice, and share their story that way. So what we did is um, we compiled those stories and worked with international media to pitch them and then went home, um, the elections were finished. Um, but what we'd left in place was um, a, a reporting network who suddenly had the, the extra skills, capacity, confidence to share their story, but also who had uh, a reporting platform, a tool where in their own time and in their own words they could submit their own stories. So fast forwarding a couple of years, um, we, the Ebola crisis hit in Sierra Leone. And actually, journalists from all organizations wanted to parachute in, um, but they were finding it difficult because um, insurance costs were very high to report on Ebola. Many areas were quarantined um, and blocked off so they couldn't travel around. So what we had um, was a network of community journalists from all around the country sharing real-time, raw and authentic experiences of what it's actually like to live through the Ebola crisis. Um, fast forward again now to 2018 and we're working still with this network um, on a project about malaria in Sierra Leone and how it affects day-to-day -day life. So, um, I'm, I'm going to yeah. pause you a little bit, Paul, because we're still at introduction stage, but you helps help me here. Oh. <laughs> how um, is parachute journalism what you leave behind or what you take away? Because you left some, some skills behind, you left some, some tools, but you also took away other things. So what, what in your view, in 30 seconds? I think parachute journalism is actually about power and it's about people coming in, deciding what the narrative is, shaping the narrative, grabbing it, publishing it with no feedback. And what, what many of our projects try and do in different countries is actually share and seed some of that power to say, um, to make it a more collaborative process. So we're the experts in production and pitching and packaging media stories. You're the experts in your own lived experience. So how can we create a powerful collaboration between those two things to make impactful and surprising stories? Okay. Paul, thank you very much. Uh, let me turn to Eliza now. Tell us a little bit about yourself and where you stand on this whole issue of uh, parachute journalism. Um, hi everyone, my name is Eliza Nyangwe. Um, I am a journalist, I, I guess in terms of my, I worked first in development organizations very briefly because I got very deeply dissatisfied with that work um, as a way of uh, changing systems and you know, uh, holding power to account. Um, and somehow I thought journalism was going to be a better way of doing so. Um, I'm unlearning that all the time. But my career started at The Guardian and I've worked uh, on international development projects at The Guardian. And f before I went freelance, I was the editor of their Global Development Professionals Network. Uh, now I uh, left The Guardian to start my own platform focusing on telling African women's stories and defining that as the five regions of the continent and the diaspora, which is self-including. So, you know, uh, it could be Afro-Italian women, it could be Afro-Brazilian women. Um, uh, and so this is a question I grapple with a lot from what I saw having sat on both sides. Uh, I write, but I've, I was an editor and I commission also. And one of my deepest dissatisfactions was um, the sense of who had the power to tell whose story um, and the ways in which those stories were presented and the, um, uh, the limited expectation of relationship or voice or agency of the people whose stories were being told um, and recognizing the uh, time pressures of an international newsroom, um, even if you're not doing news, the certain ways in which those systems work um, made it difficult to uh, do different types of journalism. But I always thought that actually first it started with an intention to try. And so for me, parachute journalism um, is all about extraction. Um, it is about seeing uh, people as just the story that they can tell, um, not even asking them or 
collaborating with them on what actually is that story. Um, so, you know, uh, that the story is predetermined and then whether or not you work with them, you are um, saying, oh, you know, this is the story I have come to get. This is the story I'm getting out of here. So for me, parachute journalism is first and foremost about an extractive relationship with your subject. And as Paul said, that subject can be anywhere in the world, but of course we're talking about international development reporting context where uh, the relationship is not set today. The relationship really goes back, unfortunately people don't like to talk about this, all the way to slavery. We have predetermined our relationship with people in the global south a long time ago, and our approaches, however subtle, our biases, however subtle, harks back to that time. And so our relationship with the subject and people who are capable of having agency and determining their choices um, and how they want to be seen is predetermined uh, based on those relationships that have been reinforced over and over and over again. Um, and I think uh, this word power is really important because I would like to go beyond just thinking about collaboration to thinking about who has access to the tools of production, who has access to the capital to tell their, their stories, who has access to platforms, who is allowed nuance. I often talk about the sort of Malala example where we, we um, look at global south context and say everyone is a victim but then there's this one hero who rises from the ashes, right? There's the one exception and we're interested in that exception and then everybody else is just the dreariness of being poor. Um, and I have experience of this, um, you know, at The Guardian I, I remember trying to tell stories where we committed even just with our photography, even though the reporting at that time in 2009 wasn't necessarily particularly radical, but we committed with even how we use pictures to use pictures that presented people with dignity. And we had our readers say to us, well, that person can't be poor, they're smiling in that picture. That person, you know, if they're poor, why are they having a football tournament? And recognizing that journalism had created uh, in part, this relationship or this perception, but also increasingly um, because our relationship with NGOs um, is reinforcing um, those particular perspectives because of how we end up in the field increasingly these days. Um, so essentially, it's a broad range of ways in which we maintain um, the, the power in deciding what the story is, in deciding where the story goes, in deciding when we share the story, in deciding what languages the stories are in, um, and other people, no matter how we might want to uh, involve them in the storytelling process, um, just uh, still somehow the, uh, the, the subject matter in which we build our careers. Um, I can give examples from my own project later. But Sure. Th yeah. Thank you so much, Eliza, for that. And finally, my, um, my third panelist, uh, Emanuela Zucala. What's your experience with um, parachute journalism? A bit about yourself first. <clears throat> Okay. Hi, I am Emanuela Zuccala. I am the only Italian in the panel. Um, <laughs> um, I've worked for, for, for many years for a women's magazine published with the Corriere della Sera in Italy that is called uh, Io Donna. And, uh, and now I am a f uh, kamikaze freelance. Uh, Italian colleagues <laughs> can understand what I mean because it's very difficult to be a freelance. Anyway, um, uh, I've been covering women issues, let's say, um, especially in Africa for a uh, for long time and uh, I've been parachuted many 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 times because uh, um, because it's something that is very common in uh, in Italian media uh, to, 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 to parachute journalism but uh, I think that uh, um, um, we should find our own way to be parachuted of course uh, because uh, um, uh, I, I found this very interesting concept in the Colombia journalism uh, review of a planned parachute <laughs> Because um, it's true that the first time I went to Africa, it was in South Africa in 2005, and I was asked my magazine to, to go there to cover a story, a women's story, and it was my first time ever in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so I was literally parachuted, but uh, um, <laughs> of course I prepared myself for two months. Uh, I, I, I created a few connections uh, with the journalists down there, with the people down there, with the NGOs, of course. And, and so I went there, uh, <laughs> okay, only for 
six days, but uh, I, mm, I wouldn't say that I was uh, <laughs> technically parachuted. Um, so um, in the Italian uh, media, it's uh, something that uh, you cannot avoid uh, to be parachuted, uh, mostly if you work for a newsroom. Uh, so you should find your own way to, to, do, to do a good job. I completely agree with Eliza. I know her work uh, uh, very, very well, and especially about women. Uh, um, I, I find that uh, it's true, especially about African women, we find this uh, very uh, terrible narrative uh, uh, where uh, women are or the heroes uh, that uh, come out from the ashes uh, or the victims. Uh, you, don't, you never know, you never have uh, uh, nothing in the middle. Uh, it's very rare to, to find uh, reporting about African women who are respectful of their stories, who also portray their stories in their, in their complexity and also, okay, their successes, but also their failures, their everyday challenges uh, so it uh, what uh, it's what i try basically uh, to do it's um, uh, yeah I, I try i try and try um, it's also true that uh, uh, you have to, uh, to to know very well the audience you are speaking to uh, because if you are speaking about africa to an audience that uh, doesn't even know where uh, i mean th that thinks uh, for instance that africa is a country and not a continent that is very common um, so for, for many people, uh, I mean, uh, Mali is the same as Mozambique. Uh, I mean, they, they wouldn't recognize them uh, on a map and they, they, they wouldn't be able to say the differences between the two countries. Um, uh, it's necessary to use a, a very simple language. So the, the real challenge we were talking about it before, the real challenge is to use a simple language very accessible to your audience and also engaging for your basic audience. Uh, every time I write, I, I think about writing for, uh, for people who are not educated also because uh, everyone has to be able to, to read my articles. Um, so combine this very simple, not uh, superficial, but simple language, accessible, let's say, um, uh, with uh, a good narrative, respectful of the people and of the community you are, you are speaking about. Okay, thank you. I've got a few questions. I'm going to be very hard on my panel, deliberately so. <laughs> um, I want to shoot down the parachutes. Um, <laughs> so we've combined development journalism and uh, development reporting and parachute journalism, that's a, that's a topic we need to unpack. Are we saying they're the same thing or are there different forms of parachute journalism? Paul, do you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think I alluded to it in my introduction. I think that um, parachute journalism can happen anywhere, actually. And I think it's, it's, as I said, it's about power and it's about people thinking that they have the right to go in and shape the narrative of what is happening in, in a community without properly consulting to that. And a, a lot of our work then is about working out how that we can, through different types of projects, how we can collaborate um, directly with these communities, how we can work with them to shape their own narrative, and importantly, how we can use the tools, the technologies, the methods which are going to make them comfortable so to share their own When story. you say you, sh you help to shape their narratives, why can't they tell their narratives? So in our, in, in our form of collaboration, what we believe is that um, we, um, they are, they can very much tell their narratives and that's what the purpose of our, our project is. Where our skills are is as a bridge in terms of our training as, as journalists, in terms of making sure that um, stories are verified, told safely, securely, according to editorial policies, whether we're working with the BBC or Channel 4 News or The Guardian, and also um, the, the production skills that sometimes required to, to, to pitch something and um, um, have it to um, a high enough level of production values. So that's where, that's where our role in, in the collaboration is, and I think that um, y you know, um, we, should, we, sh we shouldn't be kind of shy about um, wanting to have this type of collaboration, but all of, our, all of our projects start with these very, very open questions where we, we say, you know, you're leading this, they're, they're accredited as reporters, they're accredited as storytellers, you're leading this process, what should, the, what should the story be about? What really pisses you off with the way the media report about this generally? What, I, what, you know, what is it like in your lived experience? And then trying to craft that narrative together with the community. 
Okay, um, to you, Eliza, are there f different forms of parachute journalism? At the moment, we've lumped it all together, development reporting almost equal to parachute journalism. Um, I think parachute journalism is a, an approach, right? It's a way of doing journalism. So you can apply it whether you're, as Paul said, doing you know, local stories or doing international stories. It's uh, an attitude towards um, the subject, which is set partially based on uh, realistic constraints, which are, you know, if you are um, in the global north telling stories about other places, um, the amount of money that your newspaper or whatever is prepared to spend for you to go and be in a context. Um, but as I said before, also on attitudes to um, how important are the, um, is this sense of community engagement or engagement and deep listening before I do anything with the people whose stories I want to tell, how important is that for me to achieve my outcome? Uh, a friend of mine who's an Italian photojournalist gave me a very good example of this where he was reporting in Haiti um, after the cholera outbreak, and he was with a community, he had been spending a lot of time with that community, and a US photographer arrived at sunset, saw some people you know, looking pretty miserable, took a picture, that picture won the Pulitzer Prize, mm -hmm. right? Um, the idea of story and of relationship and of engagement and of transformation, what does that mean for the people whose stories you tell are, are inconsequential to large sex sections of journalism, um, whether it is international development reporting or not. So I think parachute reporting is a, an attitude that is applied and can be applied in any context. I mean, when we, for example, talk about Brexit in the UK, um, uh, I, it was only physically going to Belfast that I realized that this is a real thing. This is not sort of pawn pieces on a table, which is how you see it if you live in London. It's kind of like sort of political game playing, whereas if you speak to people in Belfast, it is a matter of life and death in a very real way, and that is not perceived if you do not engage with it at the kind of human level where you start first by listening. Um, let me come to you, uh, Emanuela. Uh, my question is, why is it necessary to bring in someone external to the situation, you, for example, into Africa to report on, on a situation? Why, in this day and age, is it still necessary to do that? Good question. Good question. Uh, I don't know if I have the answer, but anyway... Um, I don't know here, but I, I was I was participating last week in a, in a panel at the um, African Cinema Festival in Milano, and we were talking about uh, similar issues. Uh, and um, uh, and someone was saying uh, only, only African journalists are uh, able to speak about Africa, even to the Italian audience. So I. I don't agree with that, of course. If someone said uh, only Americans are able to speak about the US, we, will, we would uh, laugh <laughs> no, about it. Um, so it depends on your audience. I mean, uh, I don't know if I, I am necessary, but the Italian journalist maybe is necessary to, to go to Africa and to speak to the Italian audience. This doesn't mean that I have to adapt my storytelling to the feelings of the Italian, but uh, I know which are the elements of the story uh, that can engage the Italian audience uh, more. And then it depends on my purpose, uh, if I want to, to, to raise awareness or, uh, or just doing good and correct information. But anyway, um, I know if, uh, which, kind of, uh, which kind of points I have to touch uh, to, to engage the audience. So I think that uh, in Italy uh, I can be more useful than uh, the best African journalist to, to tell something about uh, um, to tell something about Africa, and uh, I also would like because Eliza mentioned the, the photos. Uh, I think that uh, photos, uh, images, more than journalism is uh, dangerous uh, in this context of parachuting, uh, because the images are more um, immediate. I mean, um, uh, people look at the website and they look at the pictures and the, and the titles, and then maybe they read the text. So pictures are very very 
very important to shape the narrative of something. And especially about Africa, it's been, I think, uh, from the 80s, so 30 years, so that we keep on seeing the same images, stereotyped images of the children with the flies in their face, uh, the women, uh, I don't know, the, pu the poor women. I mean, there's always a pity on the background. So they're very common, also made by very good photographers, Pulitzer winners, and, and, and so on. So it's absolutely necessary to, to bring a new look on, uh, on Africa, on developing countries in general. And, um, and this could be or engaging local photographers or engaging uh, photographers who have never been to Africa because maybe they have a, an original, a new look, uh, a new feeling uh, to, towards the people. They don't have uh, those images in their minds, so maybe they can produce uh, something, uh, something new. So photograph, in my opinion, is more important than journalism uh, um, in this moment. Joseph, would you mind, if, can I just piggyback on that? Just because um, uh, while I love and respect you deeply, Emmanuel, I, I disagree a little, um, because I think that the, the very question on who has the rights to tell whose story, while it might seem extreme, and I think when we sit here, like, so if you're in, in the States, this conversation was happening around art, right? Who can paint, can, can, who can paint African-American lives? Um, the same is happening now, who can tell African stories? Um, it might feel extreme, and perhaps as a pragmatist, I to some degree I agree, but I think that that discussion is absolutely necessary, that somehow the pendulum might need to swing that far to that extreme so that we can have the conversation that we otherwise will dance around if we don't get there, if we don't think it. Why? Because we live in a, we cannot lie that all media is equal, we are not on an equal footing. Um, we live in a world of globalized media where when President Buhari in Nigeria became president the first time, he gave his, his inaugural interview to international media, not to the local press. Why? Because he knows how in media flows, right? We still are consuming uh, media from the BBC, you know, still along colonial lines, right? If you're in Senegal, you're listening to France 24, if you're in, you know, uh, the importance of the BBC, Deutsche Welle, all these people in still shaping how we see the world. And so the sense of then, who has a, a very small subset of people, whether they're writing, editing, producing, are still telling the world stories to all of the world. And there is a, a need to question that um, so that we can start to redress it. Um, and the idea that uh, who tells Italian stories presumes that there are no Italians from the African diaspora. Um, what happens to them as bridge communities? You know, I've heard journalists say to me um, that, oh, you know, uh, Usually with poor people or, or minority communities, oh, they can't be impartial in telling their stories, right? <laughs> that somehow uh, it takes usually a white man to objectively look at what's happening and report it. If you are from Cameroon and are reporting on what's happening in Cameroon, clearly you're biased in some way, right? And so I, I think we need to question that. I think we need to ask uh, diasporic communities, where are the journalists in those communities? Why are they not more diasporic journalists in Italian newsrooms or in British newsrooms because they have a perspective. I was always the person at The Guardian, or one of the few who was always thinking, that headline is problematic. You're talking about Ethiopia, but the headline says Africa. There's, not, there's only one country in the story. Uh, it takes somebody who has uh, a relationship um, to see it because, you know, otherwise it doesn't get seen. And so I think that we need to have the difficult conversations. All of us need to move to the space where we're a lot less comfortable so that we can arrive at a place where the media is a lot better. Uh, Paul, does it matter who tells the story? Yeah, I think absolutely it does, actually. I think it's, um, I think it's actually interesting as well, sort of bridging between the two of you. We've, <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we've, we've found in our work, actually, that, um, um, yeah, while, whilst we may... We, whilst we may be useful, as you say, in helping to pitch and package something up for, um, for a UK audience, which goes back to your wider point about, well, who owns the means of production and things, which is a bigger question and problem altogether. But in the meantime, within the system that we're currently in, I think what we're working to try and do is work out how to bridge that gap. And I think that um, 
you, you know, the reaction we get from, from our stories shows that people actually appreciate the rawness and the authenticity of hearing directly from communities. People appreciate, actually, when they are surprised by a new narrative. I found that whether we're covering dementia in the UK or whether we're working with garment workers in Bangladesh or covering the Ebola crisis in um, Sierra Leone or something, when you work with communities and listen and listen to what their experiences are of this crisis, then a theme that's cut across all of our projects is that people are interested in how these different crises or health issues are affecting their day-to-day -day lives, how it's affecting their love life, their work, how it's affecting their hobbies, how it's affecting their um, so, you know, um, community relations. And actually, these are the universal themes which actually then help to connect um, audiences across the world. You know, a story about football or a love story can be um, can tell, can tell the story of Ebola, but um, in a way that connects. And so I think um, if in order to build um, the, um, w yeah, in order to create this kind of dignity um, that, that we're talking about, then I think it's very important that people are sort of picking up the mic and, and narrating those stories themselves when possible. Um, Eliza, let me, let me come back to you and maybe look at a slightly different angle to this, which is uh, news reporters who are maybe a lot more guilty of the parachute journalism that we're talking about. And there is a very good reason, from my experience of working with an international broadcaster, why you would have um, a foreign person in a foreign country covering... Re and some of it was based in, in the olden days, actually just basically on the issues of safety, yeah. that it is unsafe or, or will be a lot more safer if you know, a foreign correspondent in a particular African country is telling the story because they've got the protection of, you know, of their nationality, in a sense. So there was a reason for that. And if you do it locally, um, you will read the piece in prison. Uh, you know, so, so, but I'm saying, and although we've moved on a little bit, um, isn't there still room, Eliza, I'm challenging a little bit what you said, for a foreign pair of eyes in any situation? Because sometimes we also become desensitized to mm -hmm. our own context. So isn't there a space for a foreign pair of eyes to look at a, give a fresh look to a situation in a foreign land? Oh, yes, is the short answer. And it's not difficult because I think the assumption is that, again, the foreign pair of eyes has come from London. Why doesn't, if there's a situation in Kenya, why can't the BBC send a Ugandan reporter to cover it? Like, the assumption is that, you know, the foreign pair of eyes has to be collecting lots of air miles to therefore, you know, the, the greater, the longer your flight, the more your objectivity. Um, which is, you know, nobody sends, uh, nobody sent to New Zealand after the Christchurch shooting a Kenyan reporter to go and cover it because there was no one who was able to be objective on the ground. There's a sense that actually, that doesn't work both ways. So if we ask ourselves the question, actually, would you see this the other way around? Are we seeing, you know, on, uh, in, in Italian media, as populism rises, somebody inviting a Zimbabwean correspondent to come and give us their point of view because Italian journalists couldn't possibly be objective on what is happening with populism in their country, that would be a laughable concept because everyone is like, actually, there are people here who can talk about that credibly. Maybe we will consider uh, a, a, another European perspective. We would never create the space for someone further away. Now, on the, to the point about uh, what is, you know, why it happens in news. Um, absolutely, I think that, like my view on aid, perhaps, that these things are not just, uh, we shouldn't just have a blanket view, all of it is bad. Um, there, are, there are specific functions it should play, right, where you have someone who has a safe distance away, who is, doesn't have the same risk, even not even just to themselves, but to their family, etc. cetera. Um, I don't think it's so much a question of objectivity. I think that it's a question of risk and safety. The, the problem is that that is... Um, that sort of expat community that should perhaps be reporting on crises and dangerous things just now covers everything, right? Like that there is no room for the local journalist except to be a fixer for the story from the six-year-old who can recite the alphabet backwards to the story about, you know, political uh, corruption. Like they're now expats are doing everything. Okay, so one last question from me and then I'll throw the floor wide open. This is an existential question. So is development reporting, Emanuela, a thing of the past? 
The short answer is no, in my, in my opinion. Um, it's not a thing of the past, uh, especially now that we are globalized, that we, we have to think globally, so, um, uh, so it's important to, to, to know what is happening in the so-called developing countries. I think that first, we should find another definition because uh, personally, um, I don't like the definition of developing, count developing countries, third world, okay, is out of discussion, of course. Also, Global South, uh, in my opinion, doesn't fit very well. I don't have the answer. I, I think that we, as a journalist, uh, um, we should find another, another definition, more, m less technical, less, uh, I mean, more, more engaging also. So it's not a thing of the past. Uh, we, we should do it um, uh, um, much better. <laughs> we should not, I mean, and, and the first, I mean, the first problem, uh, I think about the Italian media uh, are the newsrooms uh, because uh, uh, Italian newsroom newsrooms are used to parachute uh, uh, people. Um, the, the state TV has only, I think I don't want to be wrong, but I think they have only one correspondent in Africa, in Nairobi, and it was very funny when there was uh, one of the attacks in Bamako, in Mali, and uh, this journalist in Nairobi was covering the attack uh, in, in Mali, but not from the desk, from the outside, from Nairobi. <laughs> so it was so funny. And uh, so we, are, uh, we, have, uh, we, have, uh, we have a lot to do. We, we have to, to shape uh, the, this narrative, both with the images and both with the approach to allow people to tell uh, uh, their own story. But it's not absolutely a thing of the, of the past. In my opinion, it has a lot of uh, potential, because we have a lot of means today to tell wonderful stories from uh, the so-called developing world. Okay, to Paul, to you next. And just on Nairobi, my former president, Daniel Moy, Daniel Arab Moy, used to excuse a lot of the things that his, his regime used to do, blaming it on the foreign press, because <laughs> they're all based in Nairobi, mm. and there's war all around Kenya, and because every story is bylined Nairobi, but actually reporting about Ethiopia, Eritrea, he used to say, you see, uh, we get a very bad name, but um, <laughs> as Kenyans, we know that was very different. Paul, is, it, uh, is this a thing of the past or not? No, I don't think it's a thing of the past. I think there's still a huge role for us to, um, you know, in a polarizing world, create more empathy, more connections, more stories which connect us on, you know, the universality of... Um, of our lives and you know I think that uh, storytelling is very powerful for that I think um, whether development reporting so whether we're talking as I said about you know communities affected by Brexit in the UK people with dementia and Alzheimer's in the UK whether we're talking about um, communities around Africa for example I think it's more about redefining uh, what reporting is and what journalism is and um, Alan Rosbridge was talking yesterday about this old model where you know we had the printing thing we handed down the newspaper and people would read it and I think um, that is ultimately what needs to change we need to cede our power we need to treat communities as experts in their own experience that they live in and we need to treat them as kind of collaborators in the reporting process rather than just sources that we're going to grab stories from. Some question Eliza. Um, yeah I think Paul's reading my notes because I wrote universality yeah. I, uh, eyes off my paper. <laughs> um, you know, like, I mean, for everyone who's interested in development reporting, everyone who will know about the Sustainable Development Goals, and one of the sort of principles was universality, which has been quickly forgotten. And universality is the principle that actually we're talking about the world. Um, and so actually, I think that development reporting should be a thing of the past, because when we're talking about maternal mortality, mothers are dying in childbirth in the US as they are dying in childbirth in Kenya. If we're talking about the digital divide, uh, and sorry, I keep using the states as an example. There are states in, t in in America where people are offline, have you know, have to go to a public library to get onto the internet, like that is happening in other parts of the world. Why can't we uh, align our journalism along themes rather than along regions? And as I said in the beginning, those those regions hark back to an old system of who runs the world. I mean, just the question of Middle East. Middle East to where? I'm from Cameroon. The Middle East is not the Middle East. <laughs> Like, you know, so you have to be sat in Europe for Middle East to make sense, for Far East to make sense. And all of those systems, we need to question them when we're thinking about um, how we tell the stories of the world to, in a modern world. Like, we're using old tools to tell new stories. 
Okay, great. You've heard from the panel. I have no opinion myself. I'm extremely highly balanced and in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Good BBC Until journalist. the panel ends. <laughs> That's my BBC training. You don't have an opinion even about what your name is. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to take a couple of questions, maybe three at a time. Uh, your hand shut up first. <laughs> Please give us your name and if you are addressing to anyone in particular, but yeah. Well, hi, my name's Laura. I actually met you in a, a different talk the other day. Um, this is just absolutely fascinating to me. Um, I'm an MA student at the moment, uh, studying journalism in Birmingham, the UK. I actually covered this whole discussion in my dissertation in my undergrad degree, so just, wow, like I have so much I could say. Um, my one question is, as someone who wants to become a foreign correspondent and is very aware of of all these issues. How do you still engage an audience that's very um, distant from where the, the thing's happening without sensationalizing, without creating negative stereotypes? How would you suggest we change the way we report so that we still make an audience listen without doing this? Cool, thank you. Yes, please. Give us, if you, if you ask your, yeah, your question first, I'll take a couple yeah. of them. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Kai Neba. I'm from Namibia, um, work in Germany. Um, one thing, this has been a very interesting panel discussion. There's been a very lively debate. It's been really cool to watch. Um, one thing, though, that hasn't really been mentioned is um, resources within media. And we've been talking a lot about um, events in Africa, how they're covered in Europe by a lot of European or Western media outlets, um, surely we, we should be talking also about resources because I know, for example, in Namibia, there is no very much zero chance that we are going to get, if you just read Namibian news, that you're going to get anything about what's happening in Mozambique, anything in Central Africa, or even in South, or even in South Africa. So, you know, sh and we probably would only hear it if we watch Deutsche Welle or if we watch BBC. So my question is, what, what role does resources play in this? Okay. Yes, please. The hand in the middle. I heard. Oh. Yes. Oh. oh, no, I heard. I. Okay, thank you. Um, hi. Thank you very much. My name is Andalusia, and I am the co-founder of a local journalist network in Mexico of freelancers. Um, I myself am, am local, but not originally from there, but mostly working on... Uh, helping local journalists replace foreign correspondents largely. Um, and uh, I want to know if you think that the term fixer and the role of fixer should be eliminated. Okay, wow, you're taking us into very hot waters, but... <laughs> <laughs> in, in eliminating, in, we'll, in the criticism of, we'll, you know, of course, we'll, in the context... As opposed to <laughs> taking out and shot. Sure. Yes. Okay, okay, good, we parachute journalists. <laughs> parachuting, okay. Um, uh, can, can uh, I? Let, let, me, let me take those three and I'll come back. Uh, let's, let's just pause uh, so that... Eliza, I'd like you to handle the one about uh, reporting from a distance for a, for a, just because you, you have an experience of that. Um, question from, from Laura. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I get this often, right? Because I know that my job is to, uh, to be provocation, I can't even speak, to provoke, right? And then I always get the young journal student who has spent good money on a journalism degree and has been thinking about their career kind of like, you know, uh, in the sand dunes of Africa somewhere, run up to me and be like, what does this mean for our career? And um, I'm not suggesting that's what you're saying, but I'm, I'm saying that this is a very common uh, question. Um, now, at no point in anything I've said does that mean that uh, journalists who live elsewhere do not have stories that they can tell. I think the, the problem and the, the solution doesn't start with you as the individual. This is not the conversation about climate change where I tell you you will save the world by separating out your trash. That is not, like, I'm, I'm, my point is about systems, right? First, you need an editor who recognizes that you, you need to tell different stories. Um, you know, international development reporting, a lot of the challenge with it is that it focuses on downstream at the people whose lives are made miserable by systems that we're very rarely covering in international development reporting sections, right? Like, why is that mother poor in the first place or whatever? Those are systems issues, and you need an editor who is interested in commissioning that, and you need a newsroom that's set up in a different way to accommodate that. So I think that um, if we're looking for lasting change, it, it, the, the, there's only so much you as an individual who wants to work in journalism and pay your bills can do. Now, recognizing the power that you have, 
um, hold the door open for other people. The, the concrete example of this, I was planning on boycotting Perugia this year because I'm like, ah, same people talking about the same thing. But because of the power I have, I can propose sub um, panels and invite other people who have not been to Perugia to speak, right? The question is, are you going to be competitive or collaborative? Are you going to share your byline or not? Are you going to offer opportunities to other journalists or not? Are you going to be invited as a, an expert because you've written a piece on Sudan and say, actually, no, I'm not, but this person is instead? Those are things that you have within your power to do. The other things are systemic. OK, Paul, some thoughts? Um, yeah, just, just to add to that and fix on that, whenever we work with you know, communities and community reporters, for us, it's crucial that they, 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 they do have a byline. So if, if it's a film project, for example, we may have uh, some producers or production team from our team, but the, the narrator, um, the local journalist who's narrating that story is credited properly and is, give, is paid you know, for their work. And I think that's a huge step, actually, is to stop talking about people as, as sources and start talking about them as reporters or narrators or, or whatever the uh, correct term is. Just to link that into the question about a fixer is um, it's the same thing as like, well, we could have a definition of what a fixer does. If a fixer is booking taxis and negotiating access and translating a few things, then maybe it's okay to have a fixer. Maybe that's what they actually are. But if what they're actually doing is telling you everything they know about their community, is introducing you to everyone and using their trust networks to give you access to the stories and telling you what the narrative should be, then they're not a fixer. They're a, they're a journalist and they should be credited as so. Uh, Paul, briefly, I wonder whether you can touch on the question from our friend from Namibia that as long as uh, African media is under resourced and you know, with, with little capacity, uh, in a sense, we will still need to parachute. I understood you do equip people wherever you work with the communities. This is a question yeah, about resources. Cold hard cash, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> is the question. Yeah, I, I think that um, I think that it's yeah, it's it's really key when we can to leave skills behind and to um, to so that that resource can be used in future. I think partly what you were tapping into taps into a bigger point about the um, uh, about which global channels and which editors can set the agenda. And that's something that, if we're honest, uh, on our radar and stuff, we're still stuck with. We can work with communities to shape the narrative in the way they want to. We can work very collaboratively with them. We can find stories that we think, and we can work on their stories with them to find stories that we think may be well tailored with these universal themes for an international audience. Ultimately, if the editorial agenda doesn't want them, the editors don't want them, if, if those powerful um, media outlets that do set the terms don't want them, then um, th there's not much we can do with our 4,000 Twitter followers. <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that's, that, that's a bigger question, but we're trying to kind of bridge that messy world in between and, and make that change happen slowly. Okay, no, so about engaging people at a distance, no? so engaging my Italian audience on, uh, I don't know, Mozambique or Sierra Leone, uh, in my experience I find out uh, something that we were talking about with Eliza, if you treat the people as you would treat uh, the Italian people, so you tell the stories of these people not like the poor women, uh, the poor children, uh, um, you can find an engagement. I mean, your audience will see these people like, uh, I mean, people like them uh, in a different context, in a different situation, but exactly like them, women like them, maternal mortality, uh, I mean, uh, pregnant women uh, like uh, an Italian pregnant women could be, okay, with different context, but uh, the same <laughs> the same human being. So this is, uh, I mean, it, this is not easy. It seems uh, easy, but it this is not, because when you are in a completely different situation, uh, you have the temptation not to treat people in a different way, but uh, you don't have to. And, um, and about the fixer, uh, it's interesting that um, uh, I, um, I worked also in, in, in the Gaza Strip um, more than 10 years ago, but anyway, there was a fixer very, very 
I mean, very, very good fixer. And so everyone, uh, <laughs> everyone uh, hired him. And so we had all the same stories <laughs> 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 in Italian media and uh, New York Times. And uh, um, because uh, everyone said, OK, OK, you do it. You fix the, the appointment. In fact, uh, this, this guy, uh, then he, he became a real journalist and uh, he's not a fixer anymore. So yeah, I'm, I agree with, uh, with Paul, but the fixer is, uh, uh, I think, is, is necessary as a fixer to, 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 to suggest the story that you have to discuss with him, uh, to, to organize together with, uh, with him. And, um, um, uh, but, but sometimes it's a big problem of money <laughs> because uh, I, I speak from an Italian point of view. Um, it was uh, very, very difficult to me most of the times uh, to convince my, my media to pay for a fixer. So it's, uh, sometimes it's, very, it's easier to, uh, to look for an NGO, an NGO that you trust, that you know, that, uh, I mean, that you know that they work well, that the, they don't want to save the world, but they are doing a, a good job with local communities. Sometimes it's easy to ask to ask them for a translator or, uh, or for a driver. Just a very, very quick point on that as well. I think that rather than call things like international development reporting and think about how we can appeal to those audiences, I mean, we work a lot with video and audio as well. And I think that basically good characters with powerful stories really transcends that. And rather than put it in these kind of boxes of, you know, this is about Kenya and this is about development and stuff, um, y you know, great characters will, will connect with people in, in different audiences all around the world. Cool. Yeah, let me take a couple more. Uh, yes, please, you have the mic. Hi, uh, Alessio, freelance journalist. Um, so this was um, a thought-provoking um, panel, thank you. So uh, it got me thinking, if you, if you are thinking about parachute journalism as a relationship of power, as an extractive relationship, can we extend the concept beyond geographic location? And can we talk about, I live in the UK, so I'm talking about the UK, the fact that most newsrooms are filled with um, people educated in Oxford and Cambridge and talk about the working class. Is that a legitimate step to do? Okay, yes please. Yeah, I, I've really enjoyed this session very much. So I'm Corin Podger and I, I, I work a lot in developing countries as a media development consultant. And I spend a lot of time teaching people to use smartphones for storytelling. So what you've been talking about resonates a lot because of this idea of people telling their own stories, right? I, th I think, I, parenthetically, I'm a little surprised at our community that we're still asking if we have to rethink the way we think about other people. Journalists, I think, should be a little bit ashamed of that, actually, to be frank. Um, so I have a, it, yeah, exactly. So I have a question for Joseph and for Paul. Um, what, I, what I see is a lack of skills, yeah? It's, a, it's not a lack of stories, obviously. Uh, it's a lack of skills. And so, Joseph, as someone who's from Africa, and you've witnessed a lot of um, access to skills, and Paul is someone who comes in. Uh, I have, it's very quickly, it's, two, it's one question and a comment. So the question is, what can be done in developing country contexts, so not just Africa, but globally, so that people can develop their own skills organically? And perhaps is part of that solution the emergence of the cross-border collaborative projects that we see in Europe, for example, because we're not calling it development reporting, we're calling it cross-border collaboration. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Let, me, let me grab one more and then we'll... One more question. Yes, please. Um, I'm also a journalism student from Germany. Um, and my question goes back to the resources from the guy who just left, sorry. Um, because especially you, Eliza, said that um, there's no space for local journalists in the, and what I was getting, for example, in places like the BBC and so on. But the question is, um, do you want local journalists to go to these um, basically European media, or um, should the goal be that the um, local media have an international audience as well? And is that realistic in the next time as well? Okay, let's take uh, those three. I'll come back on to you. Yeah, um, I'm glad you brought it back to the question of resources because if that guy mm -hmm. hadn't left, what I would have said was, 
if we keep plugging the gap with international content, there will be never a need to develop local, uh, uh, regional even journalism, right? And that's the role for uh, even like the philanthropic foundations who are giving a lot of money to international development reporting, but they're giving it to the Le Mans, the guardians of this world, um, and you know the, the, the Googles of this world who are interested in developing skills on the ground have huge Africa-shaped holes and you know, LATAM is better, Africa and Middle East shape holes in their programs where you know th they should be doing that stuff so uh, absolutely now w I don't I don't know I often say when people ask me a question that's binary I'm like let's just learn from nature like nature doesn't do monoculture there are lots of variations of everything everything we need more of everything and it is absolutely realistic because we find that the model we have is ubiquitous, so it applies all over the world, <laughs> right? W who would have thought that was realistic? When we're challenging it, let's not assume that to challenge it is impossible, it's difficult, but we need to keep doing it until one day we wake up, and as Corin says, it's no longer kind of like, oh, wow, like, you know, local journalists are covering local areas, and there is some role for international, and there's, you know, there. People migrate, people will always move. A local journalist who wants to be in the UK working for the BBC, I shouldn't close the door and say, oh no, 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 go home and cover your country. And likewise, you know, um, so it's just about having the multiplicity of options available to everyone that is currently only available to a small subset. Okay, Paul, if you can be super quick. Very, yeah, well, I'll just agree with a couple of points that were made then. Like, yes, Alessia, I think it's definitely all, all about power. And I think when, when we're talking then about power and who gets represented who, we always see that there's kind of layers of marginalization. You see this kind of move at the moment of big news organizations saying they'll hire an African journalist to cover Africa, and then you meet them and they studied at Oxford and they have a posher British accent than me, and they lived in New York for 10 years. And you know, like, so that, that is better, it's a small step, but it's not exactly radical. Um, working in Sierra Leone, for example, you, 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 know, you see, okay, you're Sierra Leonean, that's the first kind of layer, of, but which ethnic group are you from? Are you literate? Are you a woman? Are you living with a disability? And you have these kind of layers of marginalization of, uh, of who gets to speak. And about cross-border collaborations and things, like I, I completely agree. I think if we can set up skills, if we can set up networks um, for people to be able to learn from each other and share their own stories, then that's much more sustainable and much more exciting. Emanuela, the question about cross-fertilization, bringing in even African journalists to European newsrooms. Um, uh, yes, I mean, the, the, they have the right to choose whatever they want to do, and so we have the right to choose. So when, when we speak about the fact that uh, uh, it's a question, uh, it's a matter of power, um, like an African journalist is absolutely fr free to go to the BBC and ask for a job, uh, or to cover uh, to cover UK for uh, for African media or whatever, we are free to cover to cover Africa for our media. And in this um, in this sense, I would like to answer to to you because yes, I agree that we should be a bit of a ashamed uh, of, uh, of speaking about these kind of things, but uh, we are freelancers and I noticed that, I mean, <laughs> amongst fr freelancers it's more common to, I mean, to question in, to, uh, to, to discuss and to rediscuss in our work day by day because we want to, to do better, because we believe in our work. I would like that this kind of discussion um, would be done by the newsrooms, uh, by the editors, because I don't think, and I hope that somebody says that I'm wrong, I don't think that in the newsrooms uh, they are asking about uh, asking themselves about these problems so uh, I, I would like to, to hear something from the editors on this you had a question I'll take it time maybe it's up yeah time is up uh, literally one comment from you and and I'll close it up <laughs> he's had his hand up for so long uh, sorry about that Play the race yeah, uh, my name is David Ajikobe. Um, I'm the Nigeria editor of Africa for Africa Check. Uh, my question to you is: Do, do you think that practicing safe, planned um, um, uh, uh, parachuting will work? In, I mean, in the African context. And here's an example: um, We used to report a lot about the Chibo girls, you know, the kidnappings. But we said, look, let's sit down, let's look at what the foreign guys want. To, I mean, let's bring in the foreign guys. And what happened was that after the foreign newspapers and the foreign press picked it up. The government, the Nigerian government, decided to do something about it. Do you think it's that sustainable? Whether development journalism or parachute journalism is sustainable? No, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, in terms of we collaborating with foreign journalists. Yeah. Okay. Give a quick answer. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understood the. Uh, uh, 
I mean, we've, I think I've talked to this before in terms of uh, where power lies in the media landscape, right? So, um, and that is a problem. We need to inverse that. Like when Nigerians report on Chibok, when then the region reports on it, etc. The, the, the people that with power should be uh, alarmed and afraid and, you know, local media should be able to call local politicians to account. The problem is that the system doesn't operate like that and if we accept that to be the de facto way and never change it, it will never change. Um, and so at the moment we need to be in a transitionary phase where we're doing both things while we're developing the space in the middle. Okay, in winding up, very briefly to your question, I completely agree with you that uh, upskilling our African journalists is the way to go. I do a lot of that, and I'm sometimes used as a local parachute uh, by international media. Say, because you're there, why don't you help us with this? And I think it's, be it's, it's getting better, I must say. We're still a long way off, but it's getting better. Before we go, I want to do a Brexit on you guys. By a show of hand, I, we have to do this, and only one voting, not the Brits way. Um, is develop, to the audience, is development reporting a thing of the past? If you say yes, should okay. it be or is it now? Yeah. The question of the plebiscite needs to be clarified. <laughs> we can't leave Europe. Guys, I want to thank you so much for your time. <laughs> and to my panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Same again. Like, what